Hi guys, welcome to the Advanced Data Structures playlist. In this video, we are going to start a new advanced data structure, which is Bloom Filters. Okay, so let me give you a glimpse of what all I am going to cover in Bloom Filters. So first of all, we will see that why do we need Bloom Filters, right? What led to the need of a data structure of a very recent data structure that is Bloom Filters, right? And then we will see that what are Bloom filters. We will learn how to construct a Bloom filter, different terminologies in Bloom filters, right? And then we will see different operations, how to perform different operations like insert and search in case of Bloom filters, and also why we cannot perform the delete operation in Bloom filters, right? So we will also look at this. Then we will learn about the probabilistic nature of Bloom filters. Why is it said that the Bloom filters have 0% false negative rate Whereas that's not the case when it comes to calculating the false positive rate in case of a Bloom filter. So we will also look at this probabilistic nature. Then we are going to learn something very important that is false positives. In this false positive section, we are also going to do a probability computation. I'll do it in complete detail. And then we will look at those factors that are actually affecting the probability of false positive in case of Bloom filters, right? We will also look at this. And finally, to conclude Bloom filters, I'll be discussing some of the most interesting applications of this data structure in some of the big tech giants like Google and Facebook, right? So finally, we will conclude by discussing the applications. As you can see, I'll be covering almost everything about this data structure Bloom filters. So in order to keep the length of the video short, I've divided all these sections into two videos. In this video, I'll be covering what, why Bloom filters, what are Bloom filters, all the operations and the probabilistic nature, right? These four things. And in the next video, I'll be covering the rest of the two things, that is the false positives and the interesting applications of Bloom filters, right? Once you watch both these videos, you will master this data structure that is Bloom filters, right? So I request you to watch this video and the next video properly in order to learn everything about Bloom filters, right? So now let's start Bloom filters. Why do we need Bloom filters? Let us learn it through an example. Most of you must have used Instagram and while signing up in Instagram, when you were making an account in Instagram, you were asked to choose a username, right? You were asked to choose a username in Instagram and there that username that you must have chosen would be unique, right? This username would actually be unique, right? That is the policy of Instagram that every user should have a unique username or no two users should have the same username, right? So when I was signing up in Instagram and when I uh, chose the username UZAIR or my name Uzair, so that was actually discarded. Instagram did not accept it. Why? Because another user already had this username. So this was not a unique username, right? Then, uh, then I thought that let me write my username as UZAIR at the rate of 2050, right? Then I tried to choose this username. And then this username was actually accepted by Instagram. Okay, this is a unique username. So now let us try to find out that what might have happened in the back end of Instagram in order to declare this username Uzair as invalid or something that is not unique while declaring this username Uzair at the rate of 2050 as unique. So you might think that actually Instagram has this database that is actually consisting of all the usernames of all the existing users, probably millions or billions of users, whatever are the number of users in Instagram. So this Database contains all those usernames of all the users, right? And what might have happened is that this username that I was initially choosing for myself, that is Uzair, might have been searched in this database. And probably it was found, right? Probably this username was found somewhere over here. And that is why it was declared as invalid or non-unique, right? So what happened over here? So we can say that what happened over here was a linear search, am I right? So basically, there might have been a linear search. But as you know, 
there are millions of users of Instagram, right? But do you think that linear search is an efficient method in order to search for this username in the entire database? Probably not. Because the response time is very less. In the matter of milliseconds, you come to know that the username that you have selected is unique or it is not unique, right? So that is not possible in the case of linear search because we are going to do a linear search on millions of users, right? So that linear search is not the right option. So what can be another option? You might suggest that we do a binary search or we store all the usernames in a sorted manner and we do a binary search, right? So the time complexity of binary search is order of log n, right? But can we reduce the time complexity even further because we need a very fast response time, right? Guess what? I can perform this search operation in constant time by using bloom filters, right? So that is why we need bloom filters. So in order to perform this search operation in a time and space efficient manner, what I need is bloom filters. So now we have learned that why do we need bloom filters, right? So now let us see what are bloom filters. So what is a bloom filter? A bloom filter is a space efficient, it is a space efficient probabilistic data structure that is used to determine that whether an element is present in a set or not. We will learn later on in this video that why it is called as a space efficient data structure and we will also see that why bloom filter is also a probabilistic data structure, right? Where is probability involved when it comes to bloom filter, right? So if you look at this definition from here, you will realize that bloom filter is actually used to determine if an element is present or it is not present in a set of elements, right? So it is basically useful when it comes to search operation. So if you have uh, followed my advanced data structures playlist, the last data structure that I covered was tries and even tries was actually used for this search operation, right? It was used because it was doing pattern matching in a more efficient manner. So in the same way, even bloom filters are actually used to perform the search operation. They are used in cases where we need to check that whether a particular element or a particular data is present in a collection of elements or a collection of data or not, right? So in such kind of applications, bloom filters are used. We will see the applications in detail later on, but now let us see that what a bloom filter looks like, right? So understanding the structure of bloom filter is very easy because bloom filter is actually an array. As you can see, I've drawn an array over here and this array is actually a bit array. So what do I mean by bit array? That means each uh, index of this array will either contain 0 or 1, right? So as this uh, array is initially empty or our bloom filter is initially empty, until now there are no elements inserted in this bloom filter, we will insert all the words in the database one by one into our bloom filter in order to perform search operation efficiently, right? So initially there are no elements in the bloom filters. So when our bloom filter is empty, all the indexes will just contain zero. So our entire bit array will contain just zero, right? So all the indexes will have zero, right? So these indexes can either have zero or one. So initially there are no elements, so all of them will be zero. So what is the length of this bit array? Uh, so as you can see, the index is starting from zero and it is going up till 19. So the total number of indexes are 20, right? So the length of my bit array is 20. So I can write that my bit array length, which I'm also going to call as n, right? For the entire topic, I'm going to call bit array length as n. So that is equal to 20, right? So now let us perform the insert operation or let us see how do we insert words in this bloom filter. Right? So uh, suppose I need to insert these three uh, words in my bloom filter. How will I insert them in this bit array? So let me show you one insertion first. Let me try to insert cat. So when I insert this element cat in the bloom filter, some of the values over here, some of the zeros will change from zero to one, right? 
So how will we determine that which zeros are going to change to 1? How we will determine that? So for that, you need to know that while performing any operation in Bloom filters, you need hash functions, right? So you need a particular number of hash functions. Suppose we, uh, we call the number of hash functions as k. And in this case, let us assume that we are having two hash functions, okay? So we are having two hash functions. I hope you have got a fair idea about hash functions. So uh, in brief, hash functions are actually irreversible functions that take in any input, but they give a fixed length output, right? Anyway, just pay attention over here and you will understand each and everything. So suppose here we have assumed that we have two hash functions. Let us call the first hash function as h1 and the second hash function as h2. In this case, it is not important for us to know how the hash function is calculated. Like if I ask you, find out h1 of cat, okay? So uh, basically, uh, it is not important for us to know that h1 of cat might have been calculated in this way that c, c in this case is 2. So when we say a is 0, b is 1, c is 2. So in the same way c is 2, a will be 0, right? Actually, my letters are start A is starting from 0 and then Z is going up till 25. In the same way, T will be 19. So this hash function H1 might be calculating the hash value in this way, 2 plus 0 plus 19. And it might be giving out the value, hash value as 21. So our focus is not all this. This is not our focus, right? This thing is not our focus. Our focus is the final hash value. So we don't need to worry about all this, that how the hash function is calculated, right? Suppose hash function is calculated in any manner and this h1 of cat comes out to be as 3, right? Suppose h1 of cat is 3 and h2 of cat or when the second hash function is applied on cat, we get the value as 9, right? So uh, h1 of cat is 3 and h2 of cat is 9, right? So after finding out the hash values, for all the hash functions, here I have assumed that there are only two hash functions, my k is 2. What I do is that, I go to this index, so I go to index 3 and I ensure that the bit at index 3 is 1. But here you can see that the bit at index 3 is 0, right? So I make it 1. So I make this bit as 1, right? After that, I look at the other hash function, here uh, you can see that the output of this hash function is 9. So I go to index 9 and again I want to ensure that on index 9, the value of bit is 1, right? But it, it is 0 over here, so I make it 1, right? So by making the value at both these indexes as 1 at index 3 and index 9 as 1, I've inserted the word cat. So the word cat is inserted. If suppose we had uh, around five hash functions, so we would have received five output hash values, right? Suppose 3, 9, 2, 1, 6. In this way, we would have received five hash values. So all those five indexes, we would have made one in this bit array, right? In, and in that way, we insert an element into our Bloom filter, right? So it was as simple as that. Just find out the hash value of this element that is to be inserted. So we found out these two hash values, 3 and 9, because there were only two hash functions, h1 and h2. And on those indexes, we change the value of bit from 0 to 1. If they were already 1, they will remain 1. So we want to ensure that the value at this index is 1. And that is how we complete the insert operation, right? So we have inserted the first element. Let us insert the second element, dog. So suppose h1 of dog comes out to be as 9, right? h1 of dog is 9 and h2 of dog is 18, right? We don't care how the hash function calculates the hash value. For us, it is more important to know that how do we insert this element dog into our Bloom filter. So these are the hash output values that we receive, 9 and 18. So we will go to index 9, right? We will go to this index 9. So where is index 9? Okay. And we will ensure that the bit value at index 9 is 1. 
So as you can see that the bit value at uh, index 9 is already 1. So we need not do any change, right? We don't have to do any change over here. So uh, in case of h2 hash function, we go to index 18. So here there is index 18 and we ensure that the bit value at this position is 1, right? So we changed the, uh, the bit value at index 18 to 1. Okay, now let us insert the last element that is mouse. Suppose h1 of mouse, h1 of mouse is 2 and h2 of mouse comes out to be as 3, right? I'm just writing random values over here. You should not get confused that how I'm writing these values 9, 18, 2, 3, 3, 9. All these are random values because for me right now it is not important for you to know that how the hash function is calculated. So in the first step, we calculate the hash value for the word that is to be inserted that is mouse. So the hash values are 2 and 3. So we go at both these indexes, we go at index 2 and we ensure that the bit value at index 2 is 1. So it is 0 over here. So we change it to 1, right? And then we go to index 3 and we ensure that the bit value at index 3 is 1. But uh, over here you can see that the bit value at index 3 is already 1. So it will remain as 1. So we have also inserted this element mouse. So this is how the insert operation is performed in Bloom filters. Here we inserted all these three elements, cat, dog and mouse. And the number of elements that are present in your Bloom filter or the number of words that are present in your Bloom filter can be denoted by M, right? And here uh, the value of M is 3 because we have inserted three elements or three words, cat, dog and mouse, right? So we can write it down three elements have been inserted in our Bloom filter. So the value of m is 3. So now let us see how to perform search operation in Bloom filters. Let us search for the word cat, okay? We want to know that if the word cat is present in the Bloom filter or not, okay? So, uh, so in order to perform the search operation, uh, the first step is same as how we do in insert operation that we find out the hash values of the word to be searched. That means we find out h1 of cat, okay, and we find out h2 of cat, right? So of course, the h1 of cat and h2 of cat will remain same. The hash values will not be changed for the same input, right? Here also the input for these hash functions was cat. Here also it is cat. So the hash values will remain same because we are taking the same input that is cat. And right now we are searching for the word cat, right? If this word cat is present in the Bloom filter, uh, okay? So if the bit value at both these indexes, 3 and 9 is 1, that means this word cat is present in my Bloom filter, right? This is how we do the search operation. So we need to check if the bit value at index 3 and 9 is 1. If it is 1, then uh, cat is present in the Bloom filter. If it is not 1 in uh, either three is, uh, either uh, bit value at index 3 is not 1 or at index 9 it is not 1, that means that uh, word is not present in the Bloom filter, right? So, so let us check the bit value at index 3. So the bit value at index 3 is 1, okay? And let us check the bit value at index 9. So the bit value at index 9 is also 1. That means cat is present in our Bloom filter, right? or we can write cat is present, okay? So the search operation is as simple as this, right? If the bit value at either 3 or 9 would have been 0, in this case it is 1 at uh, position two, uh, 9 as well as position 3. If either of these two would have been 0, that would imply that the word cat is not present in our Bloom filter. Now let us search for another word and this time we will search for the word horse okay, for the word horse. So the h1 of horse is 3 and h2 of horse is 2. So what I need to do uh, in order to search that this uh, word horse is present in the Bloom filter or not, in order to search the word horse in this Bloom filter, I look at these indexes 3 and 2 and check the bit value at those indexes and if it is 1 in both these indexes, that means horse is present, right? So let me check at index 3. So when I check at index 3, the bit value is 1. And now I'll check at index 2. 
So when I check at index 2, it is again 1. So the in, uh, bit value at both these indexes is 1. So that implies horse is present in my bloom filter, right? So as I said earlier, the bit value at these positions, which are actually the output hash values or the outputs of our hash functions, if the bit value at these positions is 1 at all these positions, that means that element is present. So we concluded that horse is present in our bloom filter. But this is the same bloom filter which was initially empty and we inserted only three elements, cat, dog and mouse. And right now when we are searching for the word horse, it is telling us, yes, horse is present in our bloom filter. But isn't it wrong? Because we never inserted the word horse, then when we search for the word horse, our search should be unsuccessful, right? But here we are having a successful search. How is that possible? What might have happened is that in case of h1 of mouse, at this position 2, we change the bit value to 1. And for h2 of mouse, at this position 3, we change the bit value to 1. In fact, we changed it over here it's, itself. We changed the uh, bit value at position 3 to 1. Because, of, uh, because these hash values for this h1 of horse, was same as h2 of mouse and even h1 of cat. And here h2 of horse, which was 2, was same as h1 of mouse. So because of this, we actually got a wrong result that said that horse is present in our bloom filter, right? So that is where the probabilistic nature of bloom filter comes into the picture. Or you can also call it a drawback of bloom filter. That when it says that something is present in our bloom filter, it is not 100% sure or it is not 100% accurate, right? That is why we said that the bloom filter is actually a probabilistic data structure, right? As we saw that here it said that horse is present in this bloom filter, but we never inserted horse. That means it was not 100% sure when it said that horse is present in the bloom filter. So as you might know, that when something is said to be present in this bloom filter, but in actual sense or in reality, it is not present in the bloom filter. So that is actually called as a false positive, right? So this was an example of a false positive. For time being, you should just understand that a bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure or there is a probability of we receiving such kind of false positives when we deal with a bloom filter right? There is, a, there is a probability that is involved and we will calculate this probability of false positives in the next video and we will calculate this probability of false positive or how much false positives we can expect when we deal with a bloom filter. We will do this probability computation in the next video and we will also look at some interesting applications of bloom filters. So also watch the next video. So a bloom filter might give us some false positive results. So that you can consider as a drawback of bloom filter. But what are its advantages? So until now we have learned many things about bloom filters. So one clear advantage that we can see in case of bloom filters is that it is a space efficient data structure. Why am I calling it space efficient? Because as you can see over here, we inserted the word cat, dog and mouse, but we actually never inserted these entire words. We just changed some of the bits in the bloom filter and that is how we completed the insertion. That means rather than storing the entire words, unlike its counterparts like tries and arrays, linked list, it is just changing some bits or the length of our bit array is always fixed. No matter how many elements we insert. Here we have inserted just three elements, but even if we insert 300 elements, we can insert them in this small bit array of length 20. That much space efficient our bloom filter is, right? So we can say that bloom filter is actually space efficient. So we can call it as the first advantage of bloom filters. Another advantage of bloom filters is that it has 0% false negative rate. That means that when a bloom filter is saying in case of search operation that the word you are searching for is not present in the bloom filter, in such a case, it is 100% accurate. Suppose if I search for home, 
okay? If I search for the word home in this bloom filter and if it tells me the word home is not present in the bloom filter, right? If I perform the search operation and I find out that the word home is not present in this bloom filter, I can be assured that this is 100% correct or because, because bloom filter has 0% false negative rate or you can say that a bloom filter is never wrong when it declares that something is not present in the bit array, right? So we can say the second advantage of bloom filters is that it has a 0% false negative rate. What another advantage can you think of uh, when you look at bloom filters? What I can see is that I'm not inserting the word cat, dog and mouse. Rather, I'm just changing some bits. So I suppose someone hacks this bit array, what is also your database in this case, that person will not come to know that which elements or which words are actually stored in this bit array or which words are stored in the bloom filter. So when it comes to privacy, bloom filter really has an edge over other data structures, right? So if you want to maintain privacy, bloom filter is really a good option. So these were the three advantages of bloom filters that it is a space efficient data structure. It has 0% false negative rate and there is no privacy issue when it comes to bloom filter because we are not storing the entire words as we used to store in case of other data structures like arrays, linked list and trice. So in this video, we learned that we need bloom filters because in such applications where we require a lesser time complexity and a space efficient method, in such cases we need bloom filters. And then we also saw that what are bloom filters and how does a bloom filter look like? How do we perform the insert operation in bloom filters? How do we do the search operation? And then what are the advantages of bloom filters? In the next video, we will focus at this property of bloom filters of false positives that we might encounter when we deal with bloom filters, right? We will do some kind of probability computation. We will look at those factors that are affecting the probability of false positives. And in the end of the next video, we will look at some of the most interesting applications of Bloom filters in some of the big tech giants like Google and Facebook. So that's it from this video. Share it as much as possible with all your friends and subscribe to my channel because I'm going to upload many such videos in the upcoming days. Meet you in the next video where we will end our topic of Bloom filters.